Um, before we get started with today's program, I want to um, let you know what's coming up next month for October. We're going to do something a little bit different next month. We're going to have our program at the new park, the Pennsylvania Avenue Resource Center, which is at 425 Pennsylvania Avenue. It recently opened. And uh, part of the reason we're going to do it over at the park is because of our subject matter. So that's going to be on Thursday, October 10th, and we're going to do it in the evening at 530. Um, and it's going to be on Henry plant um, and the plant system and Henry plant um, was um, did uh, railroads and um, from all over the southeast and going into Florida and um, LePageville which if you know the LePageville cemetery that's off of President Street extension back there um, is related to Henry plant and the plant system so we wanted to do it over at the park so we could get um, as close to LePageville as we could we could. So that's going to be Thursday, October 10th, 530 at the park. And our speaker is going to be Heather Truby Brown, who's curator of education of the Henry B. Plant Museum in Tampa. So Heather um, Brown is coming up from Tampa to give us this lecture. So we're really excited about that. And I'll send out an announcement. Um, if you're not on our list and you want to be, just add your name on the bottom of the evaluation form I've put in front of you um, before you leave. Um, so for today, we're really excited to have Elizabeth Dubose from Asaba Island Foundation with us to talk about Indigo Past to Present. So Elizabeth um, uh, received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Holland University in American Studies. She then moved to Savannah in 1989 to attend um, Savannah College of Art and Design to get her a Master of Fine Arts degree in Historic Preservation. She served as assistant curator at the Owens Thomas House during the time when they first discovered the intact enslaved dwelling um, in the carriage house. And you've probably been hearing an awful lot about that lately as they've been interpreting the, that enslaved dwelling. She served us here at the city of Savannah government as a neighborhood coordinator for three different historic neighborhoods, including Baldwin Park, where she's been a proud resident herself for over 26 years. And then she's been with Asaba Island and the foundation for the past 21 years. And that's why we're really fortunate to have her today to talk about um, Asaba Island and Indigo and what they're doing there with their programming related to Indigo. So I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As you heard, today I'm going to be sharing the story of Indigo, past to present, Asaba Island in Colonial Georgia, 1760 to 1782. So I have the pleasure to tell you what and where is Asaba Island. Of course, it may be very familiar to a local crowd. But um, I'm looking forward to sharing this overview of Colonial Georgia's uh, Indigo economy and Asaba Island's role. And then the story of Asaba's indigo today. So what and where is Asaba Island? I'm often asked. And as you know, Asaba Island is located here off of our coast of Georgia. And it's one of 14 barrier islands that stretch the length of our 100 mile coastline. Asaba is Georgia's third largest barrier island. It's about the size of Bermuda. It totals 26 thousand acres and 11,000 of those are uplands or that's the area that would have been cultivated in the plantation era of the 18th and 19th centuries. Asaba has been used by humans for over 5,000 years and in fact the name is from the Gwali Indians that inhabited the island. Asaba means place of the Yopon Holly and this is the only plant native to North America that produces caffeine and theobromine, and that is a stimulant found in dark chocolate. <laughs> Yopon holly leaves were used for t a tea that was consumed daily during ceremonies. Asaba is only accessible by boat. And of our 14 barrier islands, you can only drive to three of them. Asaba is virtually undeveloped with a few remnants of our native population. These are our middens, are their ancient landfills. We uh, have some parts of, it's 100 years as a part of the uh, plantation economy and the enslavement of people. Then Asaba served as a sportsman paradise for 75 years. 
but Ossabaugh most recently has been owned by the state of Georgia for the past 40 years. The Ossabaugh Island Foundation has had a use agreement with the state for the past 20 years. This use agreement is to inspire, promote, and manage exceptional, educational, cultural, and scientific programs on Ossabaugh Island. And I'm sure you're thinking, but where's this indigo? But as it turns out, our indigo program on Ossabaugh connects education and culture and science and programming together. Oops, I think I missed a slide. And so now the story of Ossabaugh's indigo. Ossabaugh in Georgia's entrance into the indigo trade during the 18th century was the confluence of the rising middle class in England, the successful cultivation and processing of indigo outside of Charleston, South Carolina, and the repeal of the slavery ban on coastal Georgia. So following Charleston's Eliza Lucas's 1744 successful growing, processing, and exporting of indigo, the British government offered a sixpence a pound bounty for indigo cake to uh, encourage other colonists to produce the blue dye for the British textile mills. Instead of drab cloth, the growing middle class and lower classes demanded color cloths, including blue. Indigo produced in the colonial Georgia was inferior and less expensive than French indigo. Indigo, tinctoria, was grown and processed in the French West Indies. This finer indigo was used for richer fabrics like this gown. I tell groups often that the colonial Georgia was producing the Walmart version of indigo. <laughs> it sold for less than a third of the price of its French indigo competitor. The new sources of indigo were perfect for dyeing this everyday cloth, such as Osnaberg, a plain weave cloth, or Lindsay, which had a linen warp and a woolen weft, or, quote, indigo blue jeans, this is actually a woolen cloth and not the cotton cloth of today, and it was used to produce planters' suits. In addition to the six pence a pound bounty, the anti-slavery ban was lifted in the colony of Georgia in 1751, setting the stage for making the cultivation and processing of indigo profitable for Georgia's planters because of the free labor. So Ossabaw Island leaves indigenous hands in 1763. It was originally marketed as several plantation plots, but the entire island was purchased and gifted to John Morrell by his father-in-law, Henri Bourquin. John was the son of a tavern keeper and a Swiss Huguenot. His plantation on Ossabaw was his first foray into being a planter. John was an entrepreneur. In addition to being a planter, John was involved in colonial shipbuilding and the co-owner of a Savannah mercantile firm. His first act as a planter was to purchase the entire enslaved population from the Gold Wire estate in Augusta, Georgia. This included uh, men and women and children. He began to prepare his island for the cultivation of indigo by live oaking the island. This meant advertising the extensive lumber resources of live oak and cedar of the island, of the island and what it had to offer. One of Morell's ads in the Georgia Gazette read, on proper notice, we'll engage to cut any quantity of live oak or cedar ship timbers of any shape or size required, and we'll deliver the same at proper landing on Ossabaw. An additional ad reads, quantity of sterns, stern posts, transoms, bow timbers, lower and upper and middle futtocks, apron knees, etc. Morell's selling the timbers to shipbuilders proved a profitable way to clear the land for indigo production. After the land was cleared, John once again advertised in the Georgia Gazette. He's looking for a carpenter with the knowledge to construct indigo vats on Ossabaw Island. In the 18th century, indigo cultivation had the reputation of a crop for the beginner, beginner planters. 
Seth John Colbert writes his friend, Lachlan McIntosh in Darien, Georgia. Quote, indigo is for the weak-handed planter. Lighter work for the man with little skill or inclination for rice. Robert Bailey penned his 18th century letter to his father. Quote, I am certain that I can make a great deal more in a short time by the advantageous culture of indigo. The profits accruing from that awful weed being so great that one Negro cultivates and makes two acres and a half. Each acre produces at the lowest consumption four to six pounds, meaning four to six pounds of indigo cake is produced from one acre. The reality is the plants were easy to grow and the production of the dye could be done in a matter of days, not weeks or months. May I have a sure. So did I miss it, but was indigo already native here? No, that's coming. That's okay. a good thing here. The next, <laughs> all right, good question. I will say we have a native called Carolina, indigo Carolinia, but it doesn't produce the blue. So this all is right. where it comes from. Good, good question. John Morrell and his mercantile partners, uh, Basil Calpers and Edward Telfair, who is pictured here, all cultivated indigo at their separate plantations. Edward Telfair invested in indigo on his two Savannah River plantations. Business partner Basil Cowper planted 130 acres on his Savannah River plantation, and John Morrell planted 300 acres of Osabas uplands with Indigo sofruticosa. Indigo sofruticosa is native to Central and South America, and it's sometimes called Guatemalan indigo. And today, some natural dyers proclaim that sofruticosa is the true indigo of the Americas. Edward Telfair was a Scotsman who immigrated to the colonies in his early 20s. In addition to being a successful merchant and planter, he served three terms as Georgia's governor. Our, uh, most of our observations that I'll be sharing with you today, it's from Telfair's account books and his overseer writings. Um, his account book from 1774 records vessels carrying 6,400 pounds sterling of indigo to England. And that is con contrasted with two years prior. All Georgia planters earned 2,000 pounds sterling with indigo. So Georgia never exports the quantity that indigo that South Carolina exported. And this is according to Dr. Paul Presley's research for his book on the rim of the Caribbean. If John Morrell was unsure how to grow and produce indigo, he had a few mentors. His mercantile partners, Telfair and Cowpers, started importing slaves directly from Africa, specifically Sierra Leone, as it states in this August 30th, 1774 ad. Indigo, indigo cultivation and production, manufacturing, had been a part of West Africa for centuries. So in addition to enslaving Africans whose knowledge base would have included indigo production, his business partner, Edward Telfair's overseer or plantation manager wrote about his experiments with indigo. In this quote, Obser observations, the culture and making of indigo planting. I like to think of it as indigo cultivation for dummies. <laughs> the instructions be begin. Clear your sand, dig it at a hoe deep, making it as fine as a garden. Make from 50 to 60 rows in a task. And this simple instruction gives us some insight into the slave system used to cultivate indigo in Georgia. The enslaved people on rice, indigo, and ultimately Sea Island cotton plantations worked under the task system. This system assigned the enslaved a number of tasks to complete in a day. I might be rated as a three, meaning I could complete three tasks in a day. A man might be rated as a four or four and a half tasks. After my tasks are completed, I'm then responsible to grow my own food, cook my own food, hunt and fish for protein, because my monthly allotment is a small ration of cornmeal. Annually, I would be responsible for making my own clothes with the Osnoberg cloth, which was provided by the uh, plantation. Telfair's instructions continue. 
One bushel of seeds will sow four acres of two-quarter tasks. His planting instructions promise growth in two weeks or a fortnight. Much is written about the dangers of indigo to the enslaved. In reading Telfair's instructions of steeping the seed in crude mercury to protect the seeds from worms, ants, and grubs makes one realize the danger is from many aspects of indigo production. Only a pound of crude mercury is needed to treat a thousand gallons of water. The instructions <coughs> continue about the health of the quote labor. And it goes on to say, quote, the nice planter must keep all of his vessels and vats as clean and sweet as a cleanly dairy maid does keep hens, else he will, quote, <coughs> lose his labor. So the word lose is interesting. I think lose does not mean quit or walk off the job. In this instance, I think lose means die. I suspect the lack of, quote, cleanliness of the vats it was the cause of a short lifespan for an enslaved indigo processor. When the plant begins to grow pods and is full of blooms, this is the time to cut, early in the morning when the dew is still on the plant. But not too low, we are cautioned, or the second growth will be too bushy. The writer speaks of the color and smell of the plant at the correct time of harvest, and he is referring to the fact that the indicant is, quote, high in the leaves. The indicant is the molecule that gives us the blue. The creation of indigo requires a complex molecular process involving the fermentation of the plant's leaves. Quickly, take your plants to the first vat and pump water on the plants. Salt water out of the sea will make as good of indigo as fresh water. The instruction guides the would-be planter through the fermentation process by describing the color of the water, a transparent yellow-green color with ultimately distinct coppery purple surface. <coughs> if you're not getting the proper color, add some lime water, which is calcium hydroxide, Lime was easily obtained by burning the oyster shells from the abundant Indian middens, or trash pits, located across this coastal region. The burned oyster shell was dissolved in water. This lime serves as a base to balance out the pH in the vat. Morel, Cowpers, and Telfair's enslaved had to observe the color and the smell of the vat. No pH strips in the 18th century. <coughs> When the proper copper color is obtained, drain off immediately. Telfair's instructions advise, after draining the liquor from the steeper vat, to start beating the liquor immediately, when it is still warm from the sun. As the enslaved is beating, he suggests adding <coughs> lime water. To get an idea of the size and scale of these operations, it was suggested to add anywhere from 100 to 300 gallons of lime water to the beater vat, depending on the weather. The enslaved are relying on the color, the smell, uh, to determine that the indicant molecule had indeed properly bonded with the oxygen molecule in the beater vat. He reports that a deep purple is the desired color and that the vat should smell of stale urine. And this is not because people are urinating in the vat, but because of the fermentation process. What are they feeding it with? Uh, with sticks. I mean, okay. like a looks like a rake, if you will. Okay. And in India, they actually get in the vats and kick, so they oh. may have done that as well. For the next step of curing, the instruction describes a fine sand base or a frame or box without a bottom, large enough to hold the indigo mud from one vat. Line the frame with a woolen blanket, and then line with wet Osnaberg, the coarse woven fabric. The thickest mud is layered on the bottom, topping with the thinnest mud. A mention is made of the, quote, stench so unwholesome to the Negroes that the indigo, then the indigo is ready for the press. These boxes are bored on the side, and then cover, a cover is added that fits within the box. Then the boxes are stacked, and the water is pressed out of the mud. The next step is to transfer the expressed mud 
with a trowel to a form two inches deep by two feet long and a foot broad. The writer instructs to keep the flies off the indigo cake at all costs by laying a thin layer of cloth over while drying. Once the indigo has dried enough and pulled away from the sides, you can cut into two inch squares. When the square of indigo cake feels light in the hand and does not stain the fingers, it is fully dry. After loading your cakes in the cask for shipping, your process is finished. The instructions go on to say, get rid of your fermented weed as soon as possible because this will draw flies. So much so in March of 1774, this law was passed by the House of Commons in Savannah. All persons who may be concerned in the planting and making of indigo shall after the weed has been steeped and taken out of the vats, cause the same to be buried at least two inches under the surface of the earth or otherwise effectually destroyed within 48 hours after such weed has been taken out of the vats. Persons neglecting to do so shall forfeit six pounds. So indigo production continues on Osaba Island through the late 1700s. John Morrell Jr. and brother Peter Henry placed two runaway slave ads, one in 1780 and the other one in 1781. An amazing escape happened as two families with children take leave of Osaba Island. So no doubt these escapees were a part of Morell's indigo and shipbuilding enterprise on Osaba Island. And as I read these, think about how just these descriptions give us a fuller picture on who these people were who were enslaved on Osaba. The ad reads, Hercules, short stout fellow from the Angola country of the black complexion, speaks good English. Betty, his country born wife wench of yellow complexion, scar over left eye, speaks good English. Children, Peter, 13 years, Winter, five years, Jupiter from Angola, wife Uba and son Sancho, nine years and a suckling child. And Jack, a 15-year-old Angolan, speaks bad English. The ad goes on to describe the escape in a new 22-inch yawl, a boat that was just pitched and waterproofed, and they sailed from Osaba Island to St. Augustine to British East Florida, and there they could be free. Jupiter and his family joined a maroon community that became known as the Black Seminoles. It is reported that Hercules joined the King Rangers with Commander Thomas Brown. A year after their successful escape, Osaba's North End Plantation was raided in October of 1782 by a Captain Scallion in the galley, the Auburnock, the raiding party of Brown's King Rangers. Using Hercules' knowledge of Osaba Island and the indigo being produced made Morell's plantation the perfect target. The market for affordable indigo produced in North Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina collapsed. Large-scale indigo production in Georgia and Osaba Island ended. So now, ride with me through time. We're going to jump way ahead to 2005. So we had a man that worked for us named Jim Bittler. He was the Osaba Island Foundation's program coordinator. He was a botanist, a historian, and a raconteur. He was the one that noticed that Osaba had indigo sofruticosa naturalized from the 1700s growing on the North End plantation site. And Jim did some low-level indigo pro um, processing with student groups and did historical research about Osaba and indigo. Jim died unexpectedly on Osaba Island in the spring of 2011. That following winter, I got a lady from, I mean, I got a call from a lady named Donna Hardy. She had just moved to Charleston and began growing and processing indigo. While reading online, she found Jim's entry in the new Georgia Encyclopedia about Osaba's indigo. And she said she couldn't believe it. She had been told by historian and botanist Richard Poche that no naturalized indigo survives from the 18th century. So I invited Donna to Osaba 
to work with and process our indigo plants. Dye with our indigo, conduct workshops that are open to the public. So for the past six years, we have been using Ossabaugh's Naturalized Indigo for our fall workshop. And I'm gonna share with you a little film about modern day Ossabaugh Indigo. Um, and this uh, film was filmed on Ossabaugh's North End Plantation site, which is the one that I've been speaking about, owned by John Morrell, worked by the enslaved escapees, and was the location of that 1782 raid. So let's cross our fingers and... Osibo Island workshop, the indigo workshop, is a phenomenal thing. I am not a, a, a dye expert. I'm not a cloth expert. For me, it's been like opening do one door, not just one door, but a series of doors that I've walked through. And it's phenomenal to sit, to stand and watch and sit and see people uh, dyeing the cloth and see this 18th century process come back to life. Uh, for me, it's bringing history back to life. Uh, the quality of the people working on this project is extremely important. Uh, Ossobal Foundation, Ossobal Allen Foundation, has done a lot of things right, and this is one of them. I want to tell you about this very special plant here growing on Ossobal Island. This is Indigo Ferra Sofruticoso. That's the Latin name for this plant. There are two main plants in the Indigo Ferra family. This Indigo Ferra Sofruticoso, which is from Central and South America, and there's Indigo ferra tinctoria, which is from India. And in fact, that's where the term indigo came from, India. But this plant from Central and South America is the, is the plant that the ancient Aztecs, Mayans, and Incans used. It's what the Mayans used to create their beautiful Mayan blue that they painted in their temples and on their pottery. And it's the plant that is, has been proven has died, the oldest known fragment, textile fragment, died with indigo in the world. It's 6,000 years old. It was found in Peru. This predates by 1,500 years the oldest textile fragments from Egypt, and by 3,000 years the oldest textile fragments from China. So this, this is one of the plants that has been growing here on this island, on Osaba Island, for 270, approximately 270 years. We're cutting leaves today, right now, to um, make a new vat, a fresh leaf vat. The indigo ferrous are tropical plants, so what we want to do is show you that, it, I don't know if you can see it, but the mature leaves have a more blue cast than the, the little new leaves. So that means that the indican content is higher in these leaves. And one of the interesting things is why it grows in the equator with the indigo ferrous is that the higher the UV rays, the higher the indican content is in the leaves. So we want really long, hot summers for this indigo to grow. In fact, the hotter and more humid it is, the more miserable it is for humans, the better the indigo likes it. So we're cutting a few, we're gonna do about a pound we're gonna cut off this stalk right here that has the mature seeds. We don't put the mature seeds, we will put the immature seeds in there, but we save the mature seeds. So we get about a pound and a half to two pounds, then we'll fill this up with water and put a brick on it and let it sit out here in the sun and it really starts to ferment. It gets very stinky and nasty and draws flies that bite. <laughs> so we are going to, that was right there. You get that? Yeah. yeah. All right. What do All right. We have? So we've got a little over two pounds, Great. yay. So now we're gonna put this right here. And then to hold the leaves under the water, we put a brick on it. And there you go. And Let it sit wait. in the sun for a couple of days and it'll be quite stinky and ready to go. We're gonna demonstrate how to make indigo extract. So first, let me explain these. This bucket right here are indigo leaves steeping in water, steeping like soaking in hot water. And we're using solar power. It's like 95 degrees today in the past couple of days. So it's really, really hot. This has been, these were cut this morning. These were cut to, uh, last night and these were cut two days ago from these plants right here. These are the indigo plants of Asaba. So what we're gonna do, this one is almost too far along where it will produce indigo. So 
We are holding the branches down with a brick. First, we're going to take the brick out. Then we're going to take the leaves out. And everybody here can attest to how stinky this is right now. And you can see, look at this little leaf right here, if you can see it. It's, you can see the indicant. It's actually the color and the chemical in the leaf is, in, is a glycoside of indoxyl. And we're going to convert it to indicant. And then when it actually dyes fabric, it will become um, indigotten. So this, these little indigo leaves just can't help themselves. Their pr sole purpose, it seems to be, is to give us blue. They have no medicinal value, no culinary value. Their only purpose, it seems to be, is to make, make blue dye. So these little blue leaves are showing the endoxyl on the coming out of the leaves. So we're going to take this out. Now here's another one. See that little blue one right there? And there. So we're just going to toss it back here. We'll compost it. Get some more out. And then we're going to strain it because we really don't want the leaves in what we're going to do. And now we're going to add oxygen to this. This is the fun part. So what we're going to do is start pouring this back and forth. And by doing that, we're adding, I don't want to spill it. Oxygen to the indigo. We take turns. <laughs> and you can see it's starting to change to green already. times is that? Four. Four. So we've figured out it's about 15 times of doing this. We're looking for the color. And we're looking for the color, the color shift. You can tell it's still a little bit of blue-green, but it's not green yet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, you can see how much darker it's, it's a, a teal. This is sort of like a teal color. You see this has changed to more of a blue color. I don't know if you can see that very well. So what we're going to do now is add burnt oyster shell lime to this. Burnt oyster shell lime is what would have been used historically here on Asaba. We need to increase the pH. The pH of this is probably around 6 or 7. An indigo needs a high pH in order for it to form. So we're just going to add about, I'm very accurate, about a tablespoon of lime at a time. And then we take a stick and we stir. We've got a lot of foam today. Mm -hmm. Well fermented. Yep. And now, these are pH strips. You can get them like Used them in school, I imagine. So now we're going to check the pH. I'm trying to get you a spot. Yeah. Here, hold the package. It's pretty low still. Uh, it's pretty light. Um, I would say it's probably, well, it might be eight or nine, and we want the pH to be around 10. So we're gonna add some more lime. You wanna stir, Heather? Sure. And then we'll check the pH again. Foam. Yeah, we got a lot of foam today. Lies. Yep. Yeah. 
So the pH is We're going to need to add more. You'll stir. Historically, they didn't have these handy little pH strips. They used this, you, they used all their senses. But dyeing and using indigo, you use all of your senses. They would have tasted it, actually. I have not done that. I just don't have the desire when I have pH strips. So, um, get in there. Hmm? We don't want to add too much lime at one time. Actually, that's pretty good. That's right at 10. We don't want to add too much lime at one time because, uh, and you can see the, I don't know if y'all can see, but the foam on the surface is starting to turn brown, which is a good sign. You don't want to add too much lime, um, and you don't want to add too little. It's just a matter of sort of figuring it out. So now, historically, what would have done, and what we're going to do here, is let the indigo will start clumping together, the indigo product, molecules and they will start clumping together. Then it will precipitate out and fall on the bottom. It takes as a process that takes two or three days. And then we would draw the water off and then you would have the indigo sludge, the, the blue sludge that is then dried into indigo extract or powder. So that's it. We have cut the leaves, we've fermented the leaves, we've processed the leaves, and now we have indigo dye. I want to tell you a little bit about this fabric though. This is a piece of Osnaberg. Osnaberg cotton. And cotton was grown historically in the south, not necessarily Sea Island cotton. This is not Sea Island cotton, but these, the cotton was grown and this fabric was, the cotton was shipped up north and this fabric was woven up north called Osnaberg. And then it was shipped back down here and they made the slaves clothes out of this. So this is considered slave cloth. I put a little piece of fabric in here, a piece of Osnaberg. So I'm going to take it out. Shake it out and let it oxidize. And what's happening right now is the indigo on the fiber has not bonded yet, so it's reacting with the oxygen in the air to bond with the fiber. Voila. All right. So I hope that all of you all will consider joining us on Osaba Island in fall of 2020 for our Osaba Indigo workshops. And so if you've not been to Osaba Island, here's the way to do it. If you would text the word Osaba to 22828 and follow the prompts, then you will be aware of any time we have programming on Osaba Island. So I know we covered a ton of information. Is there questions? Yes, Kate. Okay. Have there been digs to find all that sludge or whatever that they were told to bury two inches down? So, so yes, there have been digs. And there is someone, uh, Dan, who, who did some of the digs. However, I don't think you saw any, we, you found we any. Saw a little piece of uh, blue, a chunk of blue stuff. Okay. I didn't, it's still in the collection. I didn't have it analyzed or anything. It looked like it could be. Could be the indigo uh, cake? And just as a note, the tabby houses came after the indigo production, and so we think that was from a different era, I guess, of enslaved housing. So, yes. Have you 
produce a darker, more intense color blue? Do you just let it oxidize more? You add more of... Um... So indigo, all right, I'm not a complete expert, but I'll be able to... Okay, so indigo does something a little different than other dyes. It lays on the surface of the cloth. So you would, can, you would dip it more often. And as you dip it, it layers darker and darker. You have to wait till it dries the first time before you... You have to layer. let it oxidize and then you can dye it again. So like within 20 minutes. Now, if, I don't know if you've seen some of the cloth um, from Africa that may have a nice dark blue sheen, and they will actually take the paste, or the, uh, I guess the powder, and burnish it into the cloth. Mm -hmm. So that's another way that they do that. But it, it doesn't penetrate the fire. That's right. It lays on top. So it is it's in that, until they rub off? Which is a good question, which is called crocking. So if after you dye your indigo and you don't set it in the way that we do it with, is we um, rinse it with a vinegar wash, it will crock and rub off on you. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? What research you guys uh, has you, have you done on the enslaved population? There? So our information about the enslaved are coming from um, either inventories of the owners or if they had a will, then we can find out about that. And then, of course, these runaway slave ads we're able to look at. Um, but that's for the 18th century population. And then, of course, Dan Elliott did some work um, underground and given us some more information um, of the diet, for example. But if we fast forward to the 19th century, on the South End Plantation site, a man named George Colick owned that plantation. And he has, like, I think it's like, not quite, maybe nine years of plantation records. And that is when his overseer, who really is more of a scribe, that's his job, is to write down the weather, who's doing what every single day, who is sick, who is giving birth, who has died, who went to town. So that's how we're able to paint a fuller um, picture of the enslaved lives. And there's someone who is actually writing her dissertation on that. And she was able to put together a family tree of those people who lived on the South End Plantation site. And when they leave Osaba, they go to Coffee Bluff primarily. Oh, cool. Yeah. So there's... Uh, how is that information available? So that is at the Southern Historical Society from UNC, the Colic Papers. If you like, it's K-O-L-L-O-C-K. His name is George Colic. So you yourself could look, it's been digitized, and you yourself can look from like 1849, I think, to 1860. Um, and then in addition to that, so uh, we, there's a plantation at Middle Place and a, and a plantation on the north end. The individuals who were enslaved at Middle Place, who then became freedmen on Osaba, continued to live and work on Osaba till about the 1890s. And those folks basically were driven off by a series of hurricanes, and they end up moving to Pinpoint, Georgia. So we can look at um, our... Um, Ancestors of Osaba looking, we look at census records um, as well, in addition to the inventories, to find out who used to live on Osaba. And if you look at the names of people who were living on Osaba in the 1890s, 1860s, they're the same people that end up buying land on Pinpoint. So our descendant community, in addition from being from Coffee Bluff, live in Pinpoint. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> Pinpoint. So once a year, we do a um, Lift Every Voice event with Pinpoint. So we come to Osaba, and we spend a little bit of time, and then we go to Pinpoint to have a, a tour. And then two of the people that leave the tour, um, and one of them was uh, pictured in one of the slides, is a descendant from Osaba. We can trace his family to 1815 at Middle Place. So he leads the tour. But that's a good question. Yeah. Dan. At what point was mercury used in that process? So um, it was to coat the seeds. So it sounds like they wanted you to put the seeds in this mercury bath because they believed that that would keep the ants and the grubs off of it, off of the, off of the new. I think just right when they plant it. At least that's how it reads. Um, so anyways, yeah, Ferris. Um, is indigo produced commercially today anywhere in the world? Well, certainly in India. But yeah, it is in India. And um, so here in America, we did a miniature little, um, I guess, program with Clemson. And we gave them lots of seeds, and they took and they planted um, indigo. Because here's the thing with indigo. It's a part of the legume family, believe it or not. 
So if you were doing organic farming, it could be an excellent cover crop and impart nitrogen to the soil. So if we had like rub our nose and get our wish, we would like for organic farmers to plant the Asaba indigo in between crops and then have natural dyers come and cut and process it. The thing with indigo is we can't just cut the plant and then use it later, we have to almost, you would have to have a mobile processor right there. As soon as you cut those plants, they need to begin that whole process of in the water, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, need to So the, the hedge of indigo yeah. that was in this, um, in this Film, photo yeah. um, looked like it was right up against the house. Yeah, Has it is. Has somebody taken the, from the, fields and you think hedged it purposely well, out of their house? Blind. Jim Bittler did that on purpose. So okay. we had um, the mother plant, which is, I have, I hate to announce, it's kind of bedraggled at this point. Um, and he, it was next to that clubhouse. Uh -huh. And he saw it and he finally told the guys from the state, don't mow, don't mow, it'll yeah. grow. And then he started taking seeds and okay. literally, not even really planting, just casting them in front of the clubhouse. Uh -huh. And because the clubhouse is you know, blocking a lot of wind. I've tried to make it go around the corners, uh -huh. um, but I think it's not as protected. Right. So the only time we will lose that is if we have a really heavy frost. And do you have it in other places then? Nope, on just, just that just one there. little spot. Mm -hmm. So he found just one bush. Plant. I'm not kidding. Yeah, one and he bush. looked at it. Wasn't and he's even like, like out in a field. Somewhere. Nope. Was and he's like, I think that's indigo sephruticosa. And cool. then he sent it off and had it tested, and it sure. was like, wow, Jim, you're Did right. Did you say that that first lady that you Windfall. showed the picture of was Eliza Bell and Pinkney? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that is her. <laughs> From yeah, and I is it Henrietta, and I can't think of the artist's name from Charleston that did her portrait there. So that's Eliza Lucas Pinkney. Yeah, could I get a copy of that picture? Yep, you can. Um, I think my card's in that little blue. I mean, not blue. Excuse me, oh, that brown um, in the very back. And so you can email me. Is. It's right there in front of you. The, oh, it there's is? like yep, okay. there's a card in there. So yeah, did you have a? Um, the, oh yeah. The illustrations. Processing of indigo mm -hmm. in the of South Carolina, Georgia. Yeah, I have just that little, a, right, little bit of it. Mm -hmm. bit of, um, I've always been curious about that. One thing I've wondered if, if it is accurate. I don't know anything about indigo other than what I've learned today. Yeah. But, uh, is it? Do you consider it accurate? And also, I wondered. Um, I know a lot about the Brom, but um, I wondered why he chose that. For the illustration on his map, given the fact that it seems like it was wasn't, such a minor it was a minor problem. No, and that I, does make I you. I don't know, but other than people refer to that a lot. Because you'll notice a lot of the other images were from, you know, like uh, French West Indies. Right. That was one of the only ones from the colonies that we but know you about. Think it is as far as how we do, yeah. You know. As best we can from. From his drawings and then now looking at the writings so it seems it seems fairly accurate so yeah um it seems to be in, um, in the altamaha delta at hawthorne anyway in the brailsford dead family right they had a rotation of crops there were um when they had a rotation of rice and in one of the plots they would drain and grow indigo oh that's interesting um, yes yeah, it was a good use of their labor as well as yeah, so um, that's, that's a very interesting po uh, point because um, when a historian asked me that presented at our coastal nature, coastal culture, he thought that's the way indigo could only grow is in a drained rice field. And I was like, no, it doesn't. It'll grow in sand. So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. Yes. Obviously, your interest is more of a historical perspective. Right. But for example, the artists that contacted you, do you find that there are now that this has been rediscovered and you're doing these historical lectures that more artists are approaching you because they're interested in the historic process? So um, natural dyers, I guess, are the type of artists that mostly come to take part in the um, indigo workshops that we offer. So this weekend is our indigo workshop and I'm sorry to say that they're all sold out. and. Um, you either have the hardcore, I make my you know, own um, fibers and weave to come and dye, um, and then you have an occasional just person that wants to use indigo in their art, but they're not a fiber artist. Does that make sense? We've had some people that will take the, what we call indigo mud and 
paint and illustrate with it. So I would say yes, it's definitely been a, a good crossover between the science, the history, and the arts. So, yes? Will indigo grow anywhere, or is it just particular parts of America? So it needs that hot, humid climate. So even, I would, it's a tropical plant. So apparently even just a little past Charleston, it wasn't very viable. So, and, and we've learned it's because of the winters and the freezes. So, um, like I said, we'll have a really hard freeze and it'll die down, but it's not enough because we don't have a really cold ground to freeze the seeds, for example. And Donna, the one that was featured in the video, when she lived in Charleston, she was having a hard time um, cultivating indigo. It wasn't as easy as it appears on Ossobal. And uh, let me just make a one mention is that she feels and the people from Clemson University feel that it has become naturalized and it's moved from, a, and I don't know, not an expert on plants either, it's moved almost from an annual to a perennial in a way. I mean, it still sells seeds, but they said it's, it's made a shift. So Climate anyways, change. yeah. So, you know, yes, sir. I'm one of those folks that Jim Bittler, we had oh. students down okay. early on in Jim Tunnison, and I'll say this much, it grows really well in Bullock County. Okay, well, there you go. A patch of it in the yeah. front yard, it's almost taking over, in fact. So, so even up that far, it'll still, and it does, it receives self itself every year. Yeah, I don't know. In fact, I mow it down with the mower at the end of the yeah. year. Because it's, now, do you do use any of it for dyeing? Yeah, we've done, yeah. We've oh, done, good. So I wanted to see a little Wonderful. more about the process. But yeah, we just played around with Jim and just used, so this is a little bit different experiment, or different recipe, so I'm so to think try those. But, uh, that Jim, you know, just did what he knew, but not, and yeah. he didn't have a dyer to work with. But we so. have a bunch of Georgia Southern students down there, and so they're all yeah. still running around in dyed t-shirts. That, that <laughs> right. as well. And I think was your group one of the first to stay in so. the clubhouse, so, yeah, yeah, which was the got, yellow building in the background. Wonderful. So about 2002. So to say, he was yeah. great. He was a great educator. Yes, he really, really was. You know, yeah. Do you, I, during the video, yeah. there were lots of butterflies around it. Because it was in. Do you know if it's a host plant for any? So I, I, did you notice we had some wing stem growing in the indigo? That was the yellow plant. And so oh, this okay. was filmed also in September, which is now. Okay. And um, on Osceola, we are part of the butterfly yeah. uh, survey for the butterfly flyway. So now, what I know now that I didn't know then is uh, this is part of migration season. Mm -hmm. So that was part of, so they were nectaring and migrating during okay. the film. So, right. so that was kind of a fun bonus. Um, and you said it was... And th those were gulf, gulf flitteraries, I think I'm saying that. Yes. Yeah, that's the species that's in the film. Okay. Um, the original fruticosa was from Peru? That? That's what, yes, yeah, South and Central America. Okay. And that piece of fabric, the 6,000 year old fabric, was found in Peru. So that's the oldest? That's the oldest indigo dyed fabric. Yeah. Okay. So that's why some people, you know, so they will brag, the natural dyers, that this is America's indigo mm -hmm. instead of coming from elsewhere. So, is it, yeah. yeah. One reference I read, I don't remember some of like Jamaica or what, they, they got four crops a year. They would clear the field off and replant it and pull, they get four crops a year. So I don't know if you could do that in Georgia or not. I think my guess is, and what I think I've read is it's two to three. So that makes sense if you didn't have this cold weather that you could get four. So, yeah. Can you get eyes on that Telfair of that document that you have? So it is at the Georgia Historical Society, which everyone knows. <laughs> okay. On lockdown or whatever when they're doing their, um, their I guess the... I guess rebuild or whatever. Yeah. So, but that that's where it's located. Yeah. Thank you. So we were able to get photocopies of it before the lockdown. Yeah. And um, just I, I know everybody knows oyster lime, oyster lime. But in fact, is it just crushed oysters? And if you used a different type of like a commercial lime, would it work the same way? It, or it has to be. It a has natural? to be the um, a natural lime and not natural. not like for, I guess. I'm trying to say a hydroxide lime. Is I'm saying that correct? So to get a uh, to get that lime, you had to burn the oyster shells. Burn them. So it's not just a crushed oyster shell. So it's an eight to ten hour burn at um, kind of a pretty high heat. And the idea is you're basically driving the moisture out of the oyster shell, and it too goes through a chemical process. And when I take the burnt oyster shell, which just changes um, weight and not shape, and you put it back into water, it gives off 
even though I can hold it in my hand, it gives off the heat is it, that it has absorbed through the burn and it will boil and disintegrate. Mm -hmm. And then you turn it into a lime paste. And that's still, that's the same binder that's used in the tabby construction. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's multi-purpose. <laughs> yeah. The, the, you said that it, that you would uh, set the dye with the vinegar. Yeah. Uh, a mix of vinegar the, and water. Right, the vinegar solution, does that make it color fast? I mean, or does, does it bond to the cloth? Or it will it still... semi -co if color fast. If you've dyed it correctly, and it won't crock, but what it will do, if you wash your indigo in detergent instead of laundry soap, it will, you'll need to re dye it. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. It'll fade. I don't know if you found that with so y'all's oh, over, shirts Over time, but it's surprising it's how been, long it even mm -hmm. still lasts. Laundry soap. soap. Uh, so like a Charlie's Laundry Soap or Myers, right. anything that's not like a Tide detergent, which right. in my estimation is kind of stripping away that indigo as right. best as it can. Mm -hmm. And um, just if anybody wants to come to the workshop, this is my, um, if you all go to, um, I don't know, Goodwill Vintage Shops and you pick up like linen, like pretty linens that have been stained when you dyed indigo, it's, it's the cover of great sins. <laughs> and so you can have all these beautifully blue napkins and tablecloths and whatnot. So that, that's a little fun in addition to clothes. So does anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you all so much for all of your interest and great questions.